let's start with the internal slave trade. Now, the internal slave trade has everything to do with the crop differential in the South. In the upper South, the main crop is tobacco. And tobacco in the antebellum period is not selling as well as it had in previous centuries. As a result, people in the upper South, Virginia, North Carolina, Maryland, Kentucky, they are in need of money. They need money to diversify their agriculture, to rotate their crops. They need money for fertilizer. In the deep South, they're mainly growing cotton and cotton for the most part is selling very well. And as a result, they have capital. They have money to invest. They also have land that's available, but what they need in the deep South is additional slaves. So what we see in this time period, in the antebellum period, is a number of slaves from the upper South being sold to the lower South or the deep South. And as a result, we see a lot of slave families split up at this time due to, these, due to this increase in the sale of slaves from one region to another. Now the capital, the money that the Upper South received from these slaves was very important. It allowed the Upper South to industrialize. Now on a much more limited scale than New England, but industrialized nonetheless. It also allowed the Upper South to diversify its agriculture. They started planting more than just tobacco. They had a wider variety of crops. And as a result of these changes to their economy in the Upper South, we see a decline in the support for slavery in the Upper South. Now, that's not to say everybody in Virginia suddenly became an abolitionist, but we see a lot less support in the Upper South during the antebellum period than we do in the Deep South in places like Alabama and Mississippi and Louisiana and Florida. Next, let's talk about the rise of the cotton kingdom, the importance of cotton. That map we see here is the region where we first see plantations in America, way back in the colonial period, 16 and 1700s. This region at the southern tip of South Carolina on the, um, along the coast with Georgia is where we see the first American plantations growing rice and long staple cotton. Now long staple cotton could only grow in this specific climate. But it had one big advantage. It had very few seeds and was very easy to clean. So for a long time, that was the only type of cotton that was grown in the United States until the invention of this, Eli Whitney's cotton gin, invented in 1793. Now the cotton gin allowed uh, anyone to clean cotton very, very quickly and very, very efficiently. So now, Farmers could grow short staple cotton, which can grow anywhere in the American South, from North Carolina to Texas. The only problem is it's very hard to clean. It has a lot of seeds. It was not grown widely before the invention of the cotton gin. But with the cotton gin, growing short staple cotton, which is harder to clean, is now profitable. And cotton production was profitable. It was profitable for small farmers who maybe owned less than 20 slaves, but it was especially profitable for those farmers who owned large plantations, those people we call planters. Some of the advantages the planters had was they often had enough money to own their own cotton gin. This kept their production costs low because they didn't have to rent the use of a cotton gin. They often owned the best lands, the most fertile farming lands, because they had the capital to purchase those best lands. And oftentimes the best lands were right on the river. And this is important too because it kept their production costs lower. It was much easier for a planter to put his cotton onto the river and transport it to market than maybe that small farmer who's got to take his cotton by wagon first. As you can see from the graph, Cotton production in the South, following Eli Whitney's invention of the cotton gin, was exponential. It was tremendously fast. And at this same time, we see the center, the geographic center of cotton production, shifting from along the Georgia and South Carolina coast to now heading west. From this map, we can derive a lot of facts about cotton at the time. Most of the cotton that was produced in the American South 
was going to Great Britain. It was being used in textile factories in Great Britain. Some of the American cotton that was produced, now this wasn't exported, but some American cotton was used in American factories. By 1850, the United States is producing 75% of the world's supply of raw cotton. And cotton makes up 50% of our U.S. exports. This meant that factories in Britain, factories in the United States, and merchants in the United States have their profits heavily tied to Southern cotton. And from this, Southerners started to draw the conclusion that cotton is vital to the nation's economy, and therefore slavery is vital to the nation's economy. And as a result, some Southerners really felt secure about the institution of slavery continuing because of its economic tie to cotton and cotton's importance to so many people. However, cotton production had its problems. For one, as we see from this graph, it was a real boom and bust cycle of prices. Cotton prices went up, cotton prices went down with no real rhyme or reason. It was very unpredictable and that could be very detrimental to cotton farmers. Cotton farming also wears out the soil. As planters and farmers continued to grow cotton on the same land year after year after year, it took the nutrients out of the soil and they had to do something to replace them, either rotate the crops or use fertilizer, both of which cost money. Despite these challenges, cotton is still the best chance for profit in the South. You always have the option to sell your land and move west. As new lands become available, as lands are taken from the Indians, as Texas is settled and added to the Union, as more and more lands are added, more and more land is available for cotton production. Cotton farmers could also make their plantations self-sufficient to weather hard times. If cotton prices were down, they could convert some of their land to growing beans and vegetables and corn, or maybe raising cows and pigs and sheep and really make their plantations self-sufficient. And if things get really bad, cotton producers always have the option to sell their slaves, to get money to fertilize or to rotate their crops or buy new lands by selling some of their slaves. This emphasis on cotton worries some people in the South. Two men that were very concerned about it were J.B.D. DeBow and William Gregg. Both were concerned that the South had become too reliant on the North for capital, that's money for investment, that the South had become too reliant on the North for middlemen and marketing and transportation of their goods to market, and too reliant on the North for finished goods. Now, J.B.D. DeBow suggested using slave labor in Southern factories. William Gregg had a slightly different proposal. Gregg suggested using the poor Southern whites as slave labor. Now, neither one of these proposals met with very much acceptance, in part to the fear of a free working class. In the North, they had started to industrialize. And as a result, there had been a few strikes. There had been a few riots in the North. And some people in the South argued, why would they want to bring that trouble to their region? But probably the bigger argument is why? Why diversify the economy when cotton is so, so profitable? So as a result, the cotton industry and slave labor really prevented the South from industrializing. Their over-reliance on that one cash crop left the South dependent on the North for investment, dependent on the North for marketing and transportation, and really dependent on the North for finished goods. Now, all three of these factors are going to really hurt the South when the Civil War begins. Some historians have argued, not very successfully, they've been widely discredited, that the Civil War may not have been necessary. And, and one of the arguments that has been proposed is that cotton was not profitable by 1860. This is not true. Cotton planting was profitable. Cotton planters, the wealthy plantation owners who owned more than 20 slaves, earned just as much profit from their investment as a successful factory in New England or an Eastern merchant. It was a profitable industry. 
even by 1860. Another argument that cotton and slavery was dying out has to do with land. Uh, cotton farmers always needed new land, and land was available in 1860. After all, Texas was not fully developed and settled. That was land available for cotton production. And improvements in dams, in flood control, made more land in the South available that had previously not been available. Additionally, there have been improvements in transportation during the antebellum period, most notably the railroad. Now, the South lagged behind the North in the number of railroads constructed, but they were building enough railroads to significantly lower the transportation costs for cotton farmers and therefore keep cotton production and cotton farming very, very profitable. Now, was cotton farming profitable for all whites? The answer to that is no. Small slaveholders, those that owned less than 20, and non-slave-owning white farmers were really hurt by the emphasis on cotton. There was a lack of credit in the South. That hurt small farmers. There were high transportation costs in many areas. That hurt Southern farmers. Their, their lack of access to roads and railroads and waterways really hurt small farmers. Small farmers were hurt more by changing cotton prices. Small farmers had to devote more of their land to growing food, or a at least a larger percentage of their land. As a result, small farmers in the South, unlike the planters, small farmers survived, but at a much lower standard of living. One piece of planter propaganda that was often mentioned was that slaves had a better standard of living than the poor urban industrial workers in the North. That is not true. Slaves had the lowest standard of living in America at the time. It was a lie when Southern planters said that slaves had a better standard of living. It was propaganda. Overall, the effects of all that money and all that effort going into cotton means that very little money and very little time and effort is going into developing industry and developing transportation. Yes, they built railroads in the South, but not nearly as many as the North. Another thing that's going to come back and be problematic to the South during the Civil War. Also, cotton is the only real opportunity for wealth in the South. And as a result, there's little incentive to work hard. There's little incentive to try to innovate. There's little incentive to try to do something new. And there's really little incentive to get a great education. As a result, we see lower funding for public schools, and we see fewer universities being built in the South. The one exception to that would be military academies. Uh, we have more military academies in the South, but for the most part, education, along with industry and transportation, are lagging behind in the South, and that's a direct result of slavery and cotton.